I am um, delighted to um, uh, be the uh, introducer and eventually the moderator of this next uh, session. Um, there's enormous interest in the world, as we uh, discussed very early this morning, in what information technology can do for education. Uh, and there is an awful lot of potential. Uh, so we have a panel uh, that uh, has three individuals that will be talking uh, in it. Uh, first, Peter Norvig, uh, who is Director of Research here at Google, um, is going to be talking about his experience uh, in uh, this massive open online course area uh, where, as many of you know, he taught uh, an AI course and has been involved in other activities uh, with it and has been thinking quite deeply about uh, op opportunities in this, uh, both near term and long term. Um, after that, uh, Professor Daphne Kohler, who's uh, truly one of the world's experts in machine learning and now also in education. Daphne got uh, involved in uh, recognizing that uh, you know, professors repeat the same thing over and over again, and that it's a kind of a waste of time always to not record some of the stuff and reuse it, and started thinking about how to use information technology was it three years ago. So right. Well, we, I, I think we did actually fund, uh, provide some funding to Daphne, so we're very, very proud of that because it's resulted in an enormous amount of really quality uh, thinking and a new company and a lot of universities that are, are going to depend on this company. Uh, so uh, Daphne's going to talk about uh, her company and her interest and things she's learned in doing this. Um, and then we have uh, Brad Hurwitz somewhere, who's probably here. There he is. I can see him. So uh, he is the uh, vice president of product for Google Plus. So as you know, Google Plus is one of the truly interesting things going on, at least as a at least as a um, as wonderful and interesting competition and challenge and thing going on in the industry. Brad is co-responsible for everything that goes on, and and Brad's been thinking quite a bit about the role of community and social experience, etc., in education and we'll be here to talk a little bit about that, but then we'll have a Q&A session when the panelists can all talk about uh, what they think can happen in response to your questions. There should be plenty of time for uh, questions. The speakers are gonna speak only for, I would say, about 35 minutes. So all three of them, Brad will probably talk in the shortest amount because he's not primarily focused on education. He's focused on Google Plus, I think, primarily. Prim last I heard, we're talking a bit. <laughs> okay, so um, without further ado, Peter, uh, take it away. Okay, uh, so let me talk a little bit about uh, how I got here and, and where I think the field as a whole is going. Uh, so it really started when I was writing this textbook, some of you might have seen, and so Stuart and I were doing the uh, third edition, and uh, for this edition, uh, more than the others, it really struck me of what the limitations are of uh, stamping these uh, books onto dead trees. So, you know, I would write a page like this, and, uh, you know, and some of this was difficult, getting it right and, tr and trying to explain it well. But I knew that was, what was going to happen is, you know, students would take this and they would highlight the parts that they liked. And they would highlight in a different color the parts that were really confusing and they didn't understand. And they would star sections that were good and they would write little notes in the margins. And I was losing all that. And it seemed like this was great information. You know, I had a a false start and I uh, wrote a paragraph and then threw it out and wrote another version. Why do I be the one that chooses which paragraph was better when the students are the ones that actually know which paragraph is better? And I didn't have a way to communicate with them. That, that seemed like a loss. In addition, I would do things like this. So I, you know, I wrote a program, I generated some data, I took that data, put it into Matplotlib, rotated it around a bunch of different ways and finally decided out of all possible 3D views, this is the best view. Now, I learned a lot about this data by writing that program and, uh, and manipulating it and viewing it from different directions, and the students don't get any of that. Uh, but, of course, if it was online, they could have all of that back again. So I began to think, uh, well, maybe an online class and a textbook are converging and wanted to be able to, uh, to, to get there. Hal Varian was visiting, and I asked him, Hal, uh, you know, what do you think of this? And uh, it seems like if I'm going to go in this direction, I need to know something about education theory. What do I need to know about education? I expected him 
to answer with a whole stack of books, and, I, and I'd have my work cut out for me. And he actually said, there's only one paper you have to read, which was the best answer I've ever gotten in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and that was Benjamin Bloom's paper on the Two Sigma effect. Uh, so Bloom says, if you do one-on-one -on -one tutoring and you use this uh, mastery learning approach, you keep tutoring until the, the student gets it, then you get a, uh, a two standard deviation improvement. So that's a, almost a Lake Wobegon effect. It means that 98% <laughs> of the students are above average. I should say that uh, other people besides Bloom who try to replicate this don't quite get two standard deviations, uh, but they get very big improvement by one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Of course, the problem is uh, we already have a, a crisis that education is too expensive. We can't really afford to give everybody a one-on-one -on -one tutor. Can we get close to that? Uh, of course, I ignored Hal's advice, and I didn't just read one paper. I looked at other stuff. Uh, there's a lot of very interesting things at CMU, and, and Herb Simon's always been one of my heroes, one of the founders of, of my field. Uh, and he reminded me that learning is something that the students do, not something that I do. And I took that to heart. So it was uh, time again for uh, Sebastian to teach the AI class at Stanford, and he asked me uh, for the second time to team teach it with him. But uh, he thought that maybe this was a time we could also bring it to the rest of the world. So we announced, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to put this class online. Within a week, 50,000 people signed up. And by the time the class started, 160,000 had signed up from 209 countries. Uh, in the end, ab about half of those were seven-day actives, meaning they watched at least one video uh, within the last week. And about 20,000 did all the homework and finished the class. And of course, since then, uh, and I, I should also say concurrently with that, uh, we did our class, and uh, Andrew Ng did his class on machine learning, and Jennifer Whitten did her classes on databases. That was all at the same time. And then uh, within a short period after that, Coursera, uh, who Daphne will tell you about, and Udacity, and the MIT, Harvard, and now Berkeley edX uh, are all in the game. Uh, Google got into the game uh, just in the last couple weeks. Uh, so Dan Russell, who's here, taught a, a short two-week class on how to be an expert uh, Google searcher. Uh, and he got a, a similar number, about 150,000 people signed up, about 20,000 finished. And uh, you know, so there's a familiar format now to most of these classes where there are videos. Uh, some uh, uh, back and forth about whether it's good to have a talking head or not. Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. A lot of people seem to be following Khan's uh, format of uh, just having the, uh, the writing without having the head, uh, and, and some going the other way. Uh, and so it's a combination of videos interspersed with questions where you can click or uh, answer the questions and move on. So uh, what did I learn from doing this? I think the most surprising thing to me was that motivation was really the most important thing. And, and that's a surprise because, you know, I've been at Google for a decade now, and, and for a big part of my time here, uh, my job was search, was information. We have it in the, the uh, mission statement of our company to uh, provide access to all the world's information. So I thought my job is you give people a box like this, and uh, they type in a really hard query, and we give them the right answer. And if we can do it and the other guys can't, then we're doing the right thing. Uh, but then I talked with the uh, people from uh, Teach for America, and, uh, th and I heard a story that was quite different, saying, uh, you know, here was a teacher who had a uh, third grade class, and they were already two years behind grade level. And by the end of the year, she had them up to grade level. And I said, well, wait a minute. That wasn't because of information. There wasn't any better information this year than last year. It was all because of motivation. And so I realized that that's a lot of what we have to concentrate on. And as I go back to literature, CMU was telling us that. So we had the most important innovation of our class was due dates. And we thought by, uh, by saying that uh, you had to have the homework done by the end of the week, we would get, some, uh, get students to stick around. It was also important to have peers, have the uh, discussion forums. S to some extent, the uh, prestige of saying you're doing this uh, and it's uh, associated with Stanford and so on, and the authenticity and reputation of the instructors, I think, contributed to that. In addition to motivation, I think this idea of constructivism is important. And uh, 
CMU talks about it and saying that the students have mental models, they have to build it themselves. It's not me just explaining it to them, it's them getting it. Uh, so we had the problems first and then the explanation, the student has to make predictions, sometimes get it wrong and then grapple with why they got things wrong and I should say the students hated that. <laughs> you know, they would complain. They'd say, no fairsies, you're asking me a question and you didn't tell me the answer first. Uh, you know, I'm supposed to just uh, fill in the formulas. I'm not supposed to think for myself. Uh, you know, what if I got it wrong? And so I think we, there's a lot of unlearning to do. We've, we've trained students that the most important thing is to get 100% on the, on the test. Maybe we should try to convince them that it's more important for them to think and learn for themselves. Uh, so this idea of developing mastery. And uh, I talked with Hal Varian, and he told me the story about how he came to write his uh, very well-known economics textbook and that he had run into uh, Richard Hamming at, at Bell Labs. And Hamming said, well, the thing to do is first you start with all the problem sets and the exams you want the students to be able to pass, and then you write the textbook so that they'll be able to do that. And I realized, and uh, those of you who are in the software development uh, community will see that what he was saying is uh, TDD, test-driven development. So the idea is instead of writing the code first, you write the test cases first, and when the, one of the test cases fails, then you go back and write some code so that the test case succeeds. Uh, and that's really the way uh, we did approach the class. We, were, uh, we swapped around the approach from saying, uh, gee, I have some important information that I want to convey to the students, to saying, what's the next question I want to ask the students? Uh, and try to figure out uh, what the quiz is going to be, what the interaction is going to be, what they're going to play with, and then say just enough so that they can uh, have a good experience with that next interaction. Uh, and there you see an example of the, the types of uh, quizzes we were doing. Another important thing is that it should be a dialogue. It shouldn't just be one-on-one. Uh, uh, -on -one. There was, uh, last week, there was a <coughs> Uh, an op-ed piece in the New York Times, uh, The Trouble with Online Education, saying, uh, well, the problem is that education has to be a dialogue, not a monologue. And apparently the author of this uh, piece had seen an online class, which was a videotape of an hour-long lecture, and said, therefore, all online classes are bad. Uh, and I agree that that format is, is not a very good format, and I agree that it has to be a uh, dialogue, that that is important, but I think that's why we do have online classes, because we want to have a dialogue, and you can have a dialogue better in an online class than you can in a 200-student uh, lecture hall where the, where the professors just lecture. Um, so uh, we wanted to have mixed initiative. We wanted to lecture for only a few minutes. We were inspired by Khan, who had, uh, you know, I guess on average, seven to 10-minute videos. We decided to go even shorter, to uh, about two-minute videos, and then we would have some kind of interaction. Uh, where are we going to go from there to, to kind of build this up? Uh, well, in order to do that, you have to have lots of good questions and lots of answers. And what I think we'd really like as a field is to have a tree branching structure. Right now, we have a very linear structure. So we stop a lot to ask questions. But <laughs> when you give me an answer, I just say right or wrong. And then uh, everybody gets funneled into the same next question. We'd really like to have a more branching structure where it's personalized for you. How are we going to get there? could be through very smart AI. It could be through uh, peers that uh, help you and answer your individualized questions. Uh, we could crowdsource that. Uh, we could pay a lot of money to uh, have instructors and TAs develop it all. Uh, I think we're just getting started, but we want to get down more of that personalized path. Uh, from Daphne, I, I learned about the uh, flipped classroom, which is important both for the entirely online classes and also for these mixed classes that can be partially online and then partially in the classroom. Uh, from Eric Mazur, I learned about peer instruction, the idea that uh, I'm not the best one to tell the student how to do this because it's been 20 years since I uh, have been confused about the subject. And uh, the student was just confused last week is the perfect person to explain it to the st student sitting next to him. Uh, so we want to give them more opportunities for practice, and again, CMU kind of backs that up. And then uh, social was very important. Uh, so uh, we realized that the professors can't do it alone, even with help from TAs, and that's true for a 100,000 student classroom. I think it's true even for a 30 student classroom. 
Uh, again, uh, CMU talks about that. We want to have the students interacting with each other. One of the hardest parts of doing these classes is the dynamic range is much harder. Uh, since the uh, admission criteria is much less, anybody can take the class, not just Stanford students. The dynamic range between the best student and the worst student is much larger than it is uh, in a Stanford classroom. And we have to deal with that. Uh, professor alone can't do it, so the peers have to help. And so we have various types of discussion forums. And here I show uh, some of the ones we had in our class. We had our own forum, but of course, you know, everything was rushed and it wasn't quite ready. And so we encourage students to say, well, just use everything that's out there on the web. Use the uh, Reddit and uh, Meetup and Facebook and Google Plus and uh, YouTube and Hangouts and so on. Uh, and we used all of those. And to some extent, you know, it was a negative that uh, our forum had some flaws in the first couple of weeks. Uh, but to another extent, it was really good because it meant that students had their own identity. In addition to being part of the whole class, they were part of a smaller community in one of these uh, many groups, and they, they felt more connection that way. Uh, and then here's a traditional college uh, transcript. And in terms of uh, uh, communication bandwidth, this is giving you maybe something like 30 bits per year is generated uh, on this transcript. Now, uh, there are other devices, uh, like this one, which gives you about 192,000 bits per second, which is about a trillion times more the uh, band rate and about a quadrillion times more per dollar. Uh, so can we get, uh, do a little bit better of representing what it is we know about a student? And I think this is one of the, the big opportunities for online education, is that we're interacting at more than just uh, one grade per semester, we're interacting many, many times uh, per day, uh, many times per minute, and uh, we can make some sense of that. We can do some uh, data mining on this data that we correct, collect. So to be pedagogical, uh, let me uh, wrap up, say these are the four things I learned were important. I thought going in that it was all going to be about information, and I decided it's about motivation, this constructivism, dialogue, and social. And the way I think of it is we're all trying to get to this one-on-one, uh, -on -one, this Benjamin Bloom ideal of uh, I can give you a dedicated one-on-one -on -one tutor. And we can't quite afford to do that. So uh, we can experiment with these things that are 100,000 students at a time. But in order to make that work, we've got to exploit not just the uh, one-way communication, but the communication between everybody and harness this power of 100,000 squared uh, to get close to the one-on-one -on -one ideal. Okay, Daphne next. Daphne, yeah.